What's up, everybody? It's LG Set. Today is Wednesday, March 31st, 2021. Welcome to The First Mint, a podcast where I cover marketplace trends, big sales, and everything going on in NBA Top Shot. It is the last day of the month, and what a month it has been here on Top Shot. Today's episode, we are going to recap pretty much everything that's happened, both at The First Mint and in Top Shot, we've kind of given a lot of previews in the past of what's coming up, so not going to talk too much about the month to come, but maybe we'll sneak it in. Also, the main event of this podcast is a very exclusive interview slash, you know, bro-to-bro chat between myself and Jacob Eisenberg, a voice you've heard very much if you hang out in the Top Shot community. He is the community lead for Top Shot. He does the office hours. He does the streams. But we got him here today, and a bit of a unique one. We were actually not going to talk about Top Shot that much. We were going to talk basketball and learn a lot more about who he is. So make sure you tune in for that. I want to remind everybody here that nothing on the show constitutes trading advice in any way, and that we are not affiliated with NBA Top Shot, the NBA, or Dapper Labs. I'm just a guy at his house who loves basketball and blockchain. This is the first mint. Before we kick off, if you are listening to the show on iTunes, I would really appreciate if you gave it that subscribe on Spotify as well. I think it's called Follow. If you have the option to rate this show in whichever program you're using, I would very much appreciate that. Even leave a little comment. We do the show twice a week and every type of engagement like that, especially the positives one, go a long way. So, as promised, we are going to look back on the month of March 2021 and what a month it has been in Top Shot. Many of you listening to this show might be new as of this month or new as of the month prior to it. The month started off with a huge bang pretty much right before the month started. Actually, February is like the huge boom. We had the big LE limited edition event of February 19th kicking off that boom. But March was kind of more of a... Slow and steady, up and down on the market, now kind of decline towards the end of the month, but who knows what's going to happen next. Kind of going in no particular order, let's just look at everything that's happened. So first, let's start with the not-so-exciting stuff, the marketplace. The marketplace, way back at the start of March, was not in the shape that it is now. It was often under maintenance or had some kind of delay. Also, don't forget that at some point in March, Marketplace restrictions were instituted, if you remember the night, where they were set at two hours each, where you couldn't do anything on the marketplace for two hours at a time. That was a little wild. Now we are back down to, I think, just one minute, and we have been at one minute with no marketplace delays for quite a while, so running very smooth. Very well done job there, Dapper. Other stuff that's happened, we actually had quite a lot of pack drops this month. I know it's kind of weird to think because we haven't had, I mean, we're kind of in the middle of a pre-order pack drop right now, but otherwise it actually feels like we don't have them that often. But looking back at this month, we actually did have quite a few. There was three separate all-star game pack drops in some shape or form. I know people are upset about that, a bit of dilution of that theme. But again, there was three separate drops for the Seeing Stars pack. There was a drop for Rising Stars, and then there was also a drop for the 2021 All-Star Game. Sandwiched in there was Cool Cats 3, as well as several different stress tests. I think at least two, if not if not more. I guess it's not really several, it's just a few, but still. More packs dropping than I remember, as well as I believe the pre-order was actually fulfilled this month. The last pre-order, which was Order 21, Release 21. And now, just at the very end here, we have pack drop for release 24. So quite a bit of packs that came this month. Other stuff that happened, we had the highest on-market sale of all time, 210,000 done, I think, just less than two weeks ago for, of course, what else but the LeBron Kobe tribute dunk. And, of course, we had challenges. Challenges galore. All-star challenges. Metallic gold challenges. uh, Cool Cats challenges. Uh, hollow challenges. I don't know. Probably some other stuff I'm not thinking about. So we've had we have challenges galore. We have seven challenges going on right now as of this morning. Another one I think ending today. Hopefully a few fewer challenges in the future. Towards the end of the month, we had the trade deadline, which saw a little bit of an uptick on the marketplace, which was good. A lot of activity as players moved around. And then of course the day after last week, we had 
badges the long awaited badges oh man they finally hit for the amount of times i answered questions about badges rookie badges first moment badges all that kind of stuff over the last couple months i am relieved that it finally happened they were all good questions along the way for anybody who asked them they're totally valid but now they are out now it is easy to see them badges are out that also happened another big thing that happened this month was of course new moments and i don't just mean the special sets that we just mentioned but also the new base moments there were so many new moments that came out 156 new ones had been announced on february 19th and so far we have seen almost all of those the last 51 of them that are not on the marketplace gonna be out in this current pre-order so that is a lot of new stuff coming out on the marketplace hitting the top shot ecosystem i don't know what that looks like in the future but you know some of the highlights in there were of course lots of moments from everybody's favorite stars but also some of the rookies like emmanuel quickly finally getting a moment in top shot Things weren't quiet at the first mint either. We have been growing like crazy, and I'd really just have to say thank you to everybody who tunes into the show, who tuned into our live streams when we were still doing them, who tweets to us, who follows us on Twitter, who engages, and now who reads our website. I honestly appreciate it so much. It is crazy to think that three months ago, less than three months ago is when I actually started this podcast, and now we are here, and all you awesome people are listening to me talk about this product that I honestly really love through the ups and downs. Other great stuff that's happened uh, for the first mint. We had some really special guests come on the show. Some really top end collectors like Greek Freak. Weird Kitty, one of the NFT OGs who's so involved in the space doing so much other cool stuff. Easy Aces, the man who actually sold that big sale. And then of course, Wade's a very important man in the community. And then outside of that, some other, uh, I guess, big deal people from their own industry. Of course, Whale Shark, one of the, the biggest, if not the biggest, NFT owner or community of NFT owners. Definitely one of the most interesting people I think I've ever spoken to. And then we also had two different, I guess, NBA celebrities. We had Harrison Barnes, currently the NBA player who owns the most moments and the highest account value out of any other NBA player. And of course, Daryl Morey, the president of basketball operations for the 76ers. Very stoked to have him on. On the live shows, live shows when we were doing them were not short of talent. We had Osimo DFS on the last one. Christian Petraka, the Aussie Rules football player. Rude Moose, the community uh, manager, I guess, or, or I'm not sure what she does, but she does a lot. She's, she works at Dapper, and she's also very much an NFT OG. Britt, who was awesome, who turned out to be a former like college uh, basketball star. And we even had a baby on the stream Man, like it's this community is just mind blowing. It has been quite the month in terms of just content that we've put out. And I can promise you this next month is going to turn up that dial. We have some awesome guests coming up as well as just some exciting stuff. We have a website where now we can give ourselves and so many other people in the community a voice. We're going to have more information on that on Twitter and obviously on the website in the coming days. So keep an eye out for that. Also, big shout out to all my collaborators at the First Mint, everybody who's part of the family, all the contributors. We wouldn't be here without you guys, and I'm very excited for what's to come. Almost as much as being excited for the interview you are about to listen to. My next guest is Jacob Eisenberg. So I actually only just first met him a couple months ago, even though I've followed his progress in the community since October, since he took the job. He is the community lead for NBA Top Shot on behalf of Dapper Labs. That's where he works. He has an extensive and incredibly impressive knowledge base of basketball. Every time this guy talks about basketball, whether it's in office hours or on a stream, his knowledge and his honestly just his passion for the game is so impressive. I've been waiting a long time to ask him to come on the show and actually waiting for a very appropriate time. I'm going to tell you right now, if you're listening to this show, to this interview, to hear some kind of breaking news or anything like that, you're not going to get it. This is just two guys chatting about basketball, getting to know each other, and talk about a few other things that maybe you wouldn't expect from Jacob. So have a listen. Ladies and gentlemen of the First Mint podcast, this is a First Mint exclusive We have Jacob Eisenberg. You've heard his voice many times if you are in the Top Shot community, and we are very lucky to finally have him on the first mint. Jacob, welcome. Luke, thanks for having me. Uh, Huge fan of the pod. 
Um, really excited to, to make a first mint debut with you all. Let's start with you, Jacob. Not about Top Shot, but with you as a basketball fan, as a basketball enthusiast. We know you love the game. How far back did that start? Yeah, I can remember pretty vividly the Knicks had a theme song. Um, go New York, go New York, go. Like, and, and they just had this little jingle almost. And I had like a boom box in the mid 90s and I had like the Knicks soundtrack CD. And it would basically be like the PA announcer at MSG introducing the all time Knicks starting lineup. And I, I, I think around then, so I was probably four or five years old, um, just playing on like a Fisher Price basketball hoop six feet like plastic um just trying to reenact like my my favorite knicks who at the time were like patrick ewing maybe alan houston um so i think dating back to the mid 90s i would say and and the the knicks in the mid 90s were a much more kind of successful team than they've been for majority of my life um but i've always loved the knicks and i think starting around maybe fourth or fifth grade was when I started to become obsessive about the league. And by that, I mean studying every roster, knowing where every player went to college from every given team. Um, honestly, NBA Live or and even before that, uh, NBA 2K on the Sega Dreamcast were huge opportunities for me to learn who were the best players on teams similar to now with 2K, just seeing ratings and who was good at certain things. I probably owned from NBA Live 1998 to NBA 2K 12, I want to say. Every year I would get the new game and I would just kind of play absurd amounts of video games, frankly, as a kid. And um, like in NBA Live 1998, I remember that Michael Jordan, of course, certainly didn't have, uh, he wasn't in the Players Association. So number 98 was Michael Jordan on the Bulls. And it was just like this anonymous player and Dennis Rodman, every game that you played, Dennis Rodman had a new color hair in his hair dye. So I would sometimes like start the game and Dennis Rodman just had like a pure blonde hair. And I was like, oh, that's boring. Let me quit and restart. Yeah. And sure enough, you'd have like a Spider-Man color hair. Do. And that was like part of the fun of as like a young kid just playing these video games all the time. So um, video games were a huge instrument to me learning the players, learning the teams then turned into me becoming obsessive about watching the games. Uh, growing up, the Nets were actually super successful in New Jersey, but I, I maintained my Knicks fandom and we got Stefan Marbury and things seemed like they were going to turn a corner. Um, but we always seemed to, as Knicks fans, I, I say we very lightly there, um, we would always prioritize a big flashy name, be it Isaiah Thomas, be it Larry Brown, um, but it always seemed to backfire. Um, so I'm really excited about where the Knicks are today as a above 500 team for the first time this late in the season in years. Congratulations, yeah. by the way. Yeah, congratulations on that. I hope I hope the next I hope the next six weeks are are a a happy peaceful time for the Knicks Knicks Nation, if that's what you guys call yourselves. Okay, so amongst all those games, you you didn't mention probably the greatest game of all, which is NBA Jam. Did you ever play that? Because that's mainly what I played, even to the point where I would rent the Super Nintendo extension where you could plug in four controllers, which was like super new age for like 1994 or whatever year it was to have that. And also one where, you know, the biggest omission was that there was no Jordan. Of course. Yeah. So definitely played a lot of NBA Jam at friends' houses. I was never... The, the only Nintendo product I had was a Game Boy. So I, I was on Dreamcast in the late 90s. Um, and they, they were a Sega property. So we had 2K, which at the time I think had a partnership with Sega, but never had NBA Jam as much as I wish because that game was awesome. But the other one from childhood that I played a ton, although this came in the next generation of consoles, was NBA Street because similar elements of game breakers and doing all these crazy dunks and um, had a lot of fun with it. But I was also, frankly, one of those kids that didn't actually play the game that much i would just make a franchise make an association and simulate for for years and i got so good at it and like this isn't that hard to do now there's like trade finder like feature where you can just plug in the player and you can make trades but 
like for the majority of my childhood, I like self-imposed restrictions on when I would do a franchise mode where I could only accept inbound trades. I couldn't tweak the trade at all because it's so easy to manipulate the system. Um, and I, I needed the challenge because I, you know, within, you know, a couple of hours, I could engineer a championship team from a bad team just by trading future picks and exploiting trade finders. So that wasn't as interesting as kind of making these imposed restrictions and seeing what came to me via trade. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I like that, man. That, that brings me back totally to my childhood, too, where these self-imposed restrictions on the way you would play simulate video games where I played like SimCity and I was like, no, I'm not. I'm not flooding it again. You know, like I just like all these weird things that I just make up on my own with no like peer group to run it by was that's hilarious. Um, but sticking to basketball. OK, so we, you're a hardcore Knicks fan. We know that. I think we've heard that a few times around the community and you've said it yourself. But in terms of your interest in basketball, like what what parts of basketball is most appealing? Because I know you're 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 big into analytics and you also love, you know, you there are parts earlier in your career where you were doing some reporting, some student reporting and stuff. Are you, you know, are you, are your storylines, analytics, uh, fandom, like what, how do you, how do you kind of bake that cake? Yeah. I think what I love the most about basketball and the NBA at, at large, I guess, is the, the perfect combination of strategy and game plan analytics so optimizing your strategy and game plan around the players on your team and how that that can be kind of hacked through kind of expected points per possession and different measurements and then last but not least i think basketball has the most unpredictability on a play-by-play basis and certainly there are teams the rockets for years with james harden um now uh the hawks with trey young where there's more predictability and how that play will look um, but I think the fluidity and kind of jazz in motion, right? Not the Utah jazz, but improv, every player playing off of each other, two man games within a five man court. Um, and then the the mental aspect of the NBA, where all of these players are so elite and all of them for their entire lives until a certain point, either in college or the NBA, were the alpha dog on their team, the best player, the go to scorer. And now everyone other than the top of the top players in the league have to readjust their expectations and their playing style to retrofit. Like if you're Dennis Schroeder, for example, an excellent player on the Lakers and growing up in Germany, one of the the best international players of the past 10 years, he was primary ball handler for his entire life, then comes to the Hawks. And now he has to kind of fit into this team where his skill set was not as a spot up shooter. And he has to work on all of these different things that he never necessarily had to growing up. So I think that layer of it where you can really see a player like Julius Randle with the Knicks right now really thriving because they get to be the primary creator again. But you put Julius Randle in previous contexts, either with the Lakers or with the Pelicans as a second or third option much harder for him to adjust. So I think all of those factors in play where you as a coach or you as a strategist know which levers to pull that are going to lead to the best kind of point per possession expected outcome, but having to kind of uh, compartmentalize that strategy with, well, if I get the ball to this player for straight possessions, what will that mean for the other four players on the court? Will they get cold? Will they lose their confidence? So that confluence all in one, unlike baseball, unlike football, I think basketball has so much read and react kind of immediate uh, fluidity to it that just makes for a wildly interesting uh, spectacle because when I watch the game, I rarely am watching what's happening on the ball. I'm trying to watch what the other four players on offense are doing and how the defense is adjusting to that because that's how you get the best kind of insights on which players are super portable. I, I think portability is the most underrated concept. And by that, I mean... There are a lot of guys. Clay Thompson, I think, is the poster child of portability. You could put Clay Thompson on any team in the league, and he'll make them a lot better instantaneously because he's an excellent three-point shooter and a very good defender. Then there are guys that are not super portable. Someone like I'll, I'll not not to pile on Julius Randle, All Star, very deserving, but he, he's an he's an example of someone that if the circumstances are working perfectly for him, he's going to be great. And in circumstances where he has to fit into a a bigger machine, it's much harder for him to adapt. So I think all of those uh, angles to basketball make it uh, super fascinating and fun for me. Is that new, that part? 
is that is that a product of the last like 10 years in terms of the game changing or is that you think it's always been like that i think it's always been like that but we have a way more comprehensive understanding of how that goes so i think if you were to put any team in today's nba in the 1990s just objectively because of three-point shooting and and how much the game has grown from the perimeter the teams from today would destroy the teams from like I was watching not too long ago the 2008 NBA Finals, um, Lakers Celtics, and for the duration of that entire series, both teams had the traditional power forward and center on the court, neither of whom were good perimeter shooters. In today's NBA, you couldn't do that. I think you need to have every player that can that can be switchable on defense and can at least space the floor at, or vaguely give a. Uh, presumption that they can space the floor on offense to succeed as a as a as a unit. Hmm. How do you think? How do you think then? What does that mean for the next ten years then? Right, because we've seen you know the three point revolution led by some of the best what we consider some of the best players in the league now, and like you're saying, it's like thirteen years ago. It's it's a vastly different game already. So where where does this current path take us? Right, like where are we at in ten years from now? Like who's or what is how does the best team in the league look? I think a lot more players are going to look like Anthony Davis than, say, uh, Enos Cantor, right? I really feel for Enos Cantor because Enos Cantor in the 90s would be a multi-time all-star. Watching him with the Knicks, I was surprised at just how skilled he was. One of the best offensive rebounders in NBA history, not just in the contemporary NBA, and has 20 different post combinations and is efficient on all of them but not a particularly nimble defender and can't shoot threes particularly well. So I think, you know, this is not particularly novel insight. Like players like Jaleel Okafor drafted second overall, not even six years ago, right? Those players today are almost dinosaurs. And Jaleel has done a commendable job kind of changing his body, becoming more nimble, but he's still going to, you know, In the 90s, probably a multi-time all-star. In today's NBA, not so much. And then I look at the incoming class of prospects. Evan Mobley kind of cut from the same cloth as Anthony Davis. I think he's going to be super portable. And then I think, like, frankly, we've seen in recent years that the idea of having a center, largely overrated. So I look at P.J. Tucker as a guy that really changed that perception. I think Marcus Smart played point guard in college. He could play center for most teams in the NBA. And I almost look at it like baseball, where some teams have a lefty specialist. Mm. You can have a a Cody Zeller or a Tyler Zeller, for that matter, on your bench for the games when you're going up against a Jokic or a Joel Embiid, because there are going to be enough competent seven footers to go around always. But I think there's going to be less of an importance in having that player in your starting lineup. And certainly... What we're, what we're already seeing, is, and Nick Nurse kind of spearheaded this last year, starting lineups by committee based on matchup, that should have always been a thing. You shouldn't, it makes no sense to try out the same starting five against every team because every team you're matching up against presents a new problem for you to solve for. So I, I, I really think that we're going to continuously see starting lineups change and um, how that counterbalances with psychology of these players that, you know, again, all of them were alpha dogs their entire lives. And now you're going to tell someone, we saw it with Carmelo Anthony. It took a lot of time to convince him that he might offer more value as a reserve. And now he's playing excellent um, and, and Portland's thriving because of him, or at least in part because of him. But like, how do you balance telling a player that for their entire life has been a superstar that they might be more valuable to their team coming off the bench. And I think that's where the Spurs for years really had kind of this uh, this market advantage where Manu Ginobili was a superstar, but because he grew up in Argentina and kind of came of age in Europe in the basketball scene, there wasn't as much of a pretense or an ego that he had to start, which created a ton of opportunity for them. And I think the Spurs... Uh, needless to say, they, they changed the game by really leaning into the international style. And I think that's a testament to Greg Popovich and that's a testament to Tim, Tim Duncan. Never really, you know, I don't know if you know this story, Luke, but Tim Duncan came very, very close to joining Doc Rivers, Tracy McGrady, 
and Grant Hill with the Orlando Magic in 2000. Yeah. Greg Popovich stuck to his guns and in the next two drafts drafted Tony Parker and Manu Ginobili. And Manu was the 58th pick. Tony Parker was the 29th pick. Like these were not household names. And I think Tim Duncan was one of the most cerebral and underrated superstars of all time, not just because of what he did on the court, but his open mind to giving these players a shot. Because I think a lot of superstars would have been pretty impatient and said, no, let me get the equivalent of a replacement level starting point guard. I don't want to put in the time to develop this guy like a Tony Parker. Right. Right, right, right. That makes sense. I got to go back to something you said uh, halfway through that about, you know, Nick Nurse kind of pioneering the idea of cha- constantly changing your starting five. Would you see like a, a like a really twisted future where this, a game is starting and a starting five roll out for one team and the starting five roll out for the other team and then one coach makes a change right before the tip off? And then the other coach makes a change like we've seen in baseball where literally like pitch by pitch, you end up like somebody rolls out like a different pitcher, like each literally each batter. You end up having this weird battle of attrition between the managers of like, I can need my lefty against your lefty. And they keep changing like baseball has gotten kind of weird with analytics. Right. And it's and it's it's kind of like, I don't even know what's happening sometimes. So do you think basketball could have like a strange fate like that down the line? So I, I don't think that the rules allow that. I That's think fair. you have to submit your starting lineup to the officials half an hour before the game starts. Um, as I only know that because I used to be in these scrums when these like surprise announcements of who was starting would happen. And, and they, it, there are a few reasons for that. It gives the, the media an opportunity to cover the starting lineup before the game starts. Yeah, I certainly foresee... You know, you play the first possession and then you put in the the, the change up of, OK, now we're doing a full kind of overhaul of what the starting lineup looks like. Um, I, I could totally see that happening. I mean, I still think that there's ego and a lot of pride at stake of who the starting five is. And there's a lot of kind of chemistry to balance when you're making these decisions. But, yeah, I absolutely think that we're going to get closer to a, a day where this idea of a lefty specialist in the NBA, uh, and and I I used kind of the seven-footer that has strength as the de facto example, you know, be it Bismack, Biombo, Cody Zeller, uh, or any non-Charlotte Hornet or former Charlotte (laughs) Hornet big. But, I, 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 you know, you can see that in a lot of different directions. You can see, like the Knicks, for example, in their heyday, or at least in their heyday of me being uh, an adult fan, 2012 they had a three point guard lineup where jason kidd was essentially defending power forwards because he was strong enough to and they had raymond felton and pablo prigioni in the backcourt as well and what that did is it really confused opponents and we saw that with the Suns. they had goran Dragic, isaiah thomas and eric bledsoe and they did a similar thing all of the advanced metrics for both of those teams actually showed that having three point guards was actually pretty good um, and it enabled floor spacing And I think the Warriors have been the number one kind of opportunists here where in their peak with the death squad lineup, right? They had Steph Curry point guard objectively. Draymond Green played primary ball handler at Michigan State for two years and, you know, averaged six plus assists for a lot of that. Andrea Godala saw the court like a point guard. Uh, Sean Livingston saw the court like a point guard. Uh, Clay Thompson played a lot of point guard at Washington State and was probably the the least equipped to play point guard in the NBA of that group. Mm-hmm. So I think we're going to see more teams that are looking for guys that whether they're seven feet tall or six feet tall, they have ample experience being primary creator, but can also play off ball. And that's that's kind of the missing ingredient right now. There are a lot of players that are not equipped to play off ball. So I think in training as players grow, uh, spot up shooting is going to be a super focus. You, you, you know, you see the game in such a experienced and enthusiastic and well-educated uh, point of view. And, you know, I think, I think there's a lot of people who are in top shot who see it the same way, but there's also a lot of people in top shot who are, um, you know, not as hardcore NBA fans, some people that might only watch the playoffs or watch when their team's doing well, which is totally fine. That's that's a huge part of the fan experience as well as, you know, not ha- not feeling like you have to be tuned in all the time. But maybe for some of those people, like, you know, the ones like you're saying who, and even sometimes like me, where it's like, I am watching the ball. I'm not watching, you know, the setup or, or what, or, you know, even like the, what was the, the 
strategy against Steph Curry the Raptors used um uh where they all blo- they all just guarded Curry and <laughs> let him try to, oh, yeah. uh whatever it was um uh, what you know give me like two pieces of advice for somebody who doesn't who doesn't visualize the game in, in coaching strategies or in movement or anything like that who mainly just watches the scoring plays how can they start to look at that how can how can they watch a basketball game and look for what you see yeah so i i would say as you said the the first piece of advice is try conscientiously make a uh, make a concerted effort to watch what's going on away from where the ball is and if you can get to a point where you're you're doing that enough that you can always have one eye on the ball and one eye on the action that's happening off ball you're going to discover a lot of trends and uh angles to which players are valuable which players would be unexpected that defenders are really scheming on and trying to like either uh, defend, uh, deny ball entry to, or chasing around the court. Like you see that with JJ Redick, he'll just run for five miles a game, just running. There's a play called floppy, which is essentially uh, elevator doors converging where two uh, offensive big men are kind of screening. And the player like JJ Redick is running through the elevator doors as the screens are being set. So only the shooter can sneak by and the defenders are chasing him and then they get kind of stood up by a good screen. So that's something that I would say. And then the other thing that I think really gets undervalued or unnoticed here is body language. And I think you can see this in a lot of different ways. Um, The most kind of obvious case of this is uh, a player receives a pass and there's little time on the shot clock so they have to shoot depending on where that pass comes in be it kind of chest level which is kind of considered the shooting pocket for a lot of players and the preferred place to get it or you get it super low the chances are that impacts the odds of making that shot significantly more than like who's shooting the shot how the ball was delivered will play a huge role and there are going to be ample times where a player Russell Westbrook was kind of the king of this. He would start a game really, really hot and they would sum of, sub him out. And then he would come back and he would be put in a difficult position upon re-entering the game, such as getting the ball uh, with little time left on the shot clock or forcing a pass that wasn't there. And all of a sudden, the really hot start that he had, he takes himself out of that confidence because he's reintroduced to the court and has not kind of started off with a bang like he had. Those would be my two pieces of advice. Watch what's happening off ball and also notice the chemistry amongst between teammates and the body language. And if you get a pass late in the shot clock and you miss the shot, are you going to be mad at yourself? Are you mad at your teammate? How does that manifest itself in body language? Are you getting back on defense and going to just try to like, this is why I love Marcus Smart and Draymond Green so much. Whatever they do on offense, they are going to make up for it on defense and they're not going to let it get in the way. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. They're so hard. They're a team where you play, you play against those guys in the playoffs and you hate you hate just how multi-tool those guys are and how much they get under the other team's skin, but they're so effective. Um, I'm going to ask you a question that I already know the answer to, but I do want you to reiterate it. Who's your favorite player of all time and why? So my favorite Nick of all time, which Nick, I think is... Nick is, uh, is the question I'm asking for sure. So my favorite Nick of all time is Pablo Prigioni. Um, And I mentioned him earlier. He was one of the kind of three-headed point guard monster with the 2012 Knicks. Um, And why I loved him so much, there were maybe three or four reasons. The first reason, he was was a 35-year-old rookie. Like, that does not happen. That's like a... It's like a Vince Papali invincible story or a, a, a Rudy, like straight out of a Disney sports movie. Um, good reference of Rudy. That's such a good reference. <laughs> and he played so much overseas. Like I, he, he was a star in Argentina, a uh, star for Real Madrid, played in the Spanish league, which like I think a popular misconception among casual fans is like the best Spanish team could easily be an average NBA team on a given night. And we see that in the Olympics all the time. All it takes is a team that's playing really well to, to catch momentum. But going back to Priz, what I loved about him the most was kind of two things. He had a, a super flair for the dramatic. So he had this unbelievable dichotomy of being super flashy whenever he could be 
and still being extremely restrained to not have unnecessary turnovers, which was a perfect storm of, I think there are times where you'll forgive a player because they have 12 assists, but then you look at the box score and they had four turnovers. And at the end of the day, those turnovers are really costly. So Prigioni managed to be really flashy while not turning it over, which is really hard to do. But the thing I think I loved about him the very, very most was how pesky he was. He was called Pablo the Pest. And part of the reason he was considered a pest, and I actually adopted this into my playing style, was the number of times in a game where the inbounder is going to inbound the ball casually, just assuming that the defense is sprinting back to be in better position on defense, is like three or four times a game. And Pablo made a living out of just catching inbounders unsuspecting and stealing the inbounds pass. He did that at least every other game once. And it was just such a momentum boost for his team because that's a free possession just from being clever and anticipating, again, body language. Like this is going to be an instance where a player two possessions before got a pass with three seconds left on the shot clock, forced up a shot and is now angry. And now they're kind of in their own head. And now they're just like inbounding the ball two possessions later and they're not looking at the court that much. And Pablo would swoop in and steal the ball. So I think he was like the master at anticipating and gaming edges um, that way. So I, I really appreciated that. Sticking on the personal side, we did want to dive into a, a little bit of stuff that's outside of basketball and, and learn a little bit about bit more about you. Um, I've heard that you speak Portuguese fluently. Is that a fact? Is that true? Uh, fluently is a, an exaggeration at this point. But I, I speak it I speak it well enough to convince a Brazilian that I am Brazilian. Um, and I've had multiple instances where I've had to show my U.S. P- passport or ID to prove that I'm an American. Um, and I don't think I like I speak better than I understand. And if I'm in a conversation with someone, there's a 50 50 chance that it's just going to be way too fast for me to interpret as the, as they go. But I have had a dream in Portuguese and particularly I lived in Brazil for a year. Okay. So um at the end of that kind of experience, um, and it, it was like seven and a half months, it wasn't a full 12 months, but uh, at the end of that experience, I was very much like going to the neighborhood bar and could confidently like with three beers in my system, I could confidently like uh, do plu perfect or all of these different conjugations and tenses that would have even right now, just thinking back to it, I I think like, how was I able to do it? Because I'd be intimidated to try. But I, I, if we were having a conversation in Portuguese, I could convince you that I speak. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Where did, why, why Portuguese? Is it, is family or just passion? Where's that coming from? No, no one in the family. I I took Spanish from sixth to 12th grade. Then I went to college and I needed to take a language requirement. And I was looking at where I wanted to study abroad. And this was uh, 2014. And I kind of formulated a three-year plan where I would start taking Portuguese, go down to Brazil. The World Cup was in Brazil that year. So I would, at the time, I was trying to be a sports writer. Maybe I could intern for a, a U.S. paper and get to go to games and talk to players and do that fun stuff. Um, and then return two years later in 2016 when the Olympics came. And that would be my like leg up in the journalism world that I would know Portuguese and I would know the city of Brazil and anyone would want to hire me because I could take them around the city when they weren't covering games um, or I could do it myself. Didn't really work out that way, but that was kind of what led me down to Brazil. And I had an unbelievable time there. Uh, I have zero regrets about choosing that in particular Rio as the city that I studied abroad in, um, but certainly don't get to practice Portuguese all that much in my day to day. But weirdly, there are like 10 or 12 uh, Brazilians or, or Portuguese uh, speakers at uh, Dapper Labs. Okay. So there there is a Portuguese channel and, and sometimes I get to look in there and, and feel kind of privileged that they think that I actually understand all that they're saying. Speaking of Dapper Labs, uh, we won't talk about the the product that's brought us together too much. But especially these days, I mean, I'm sure work life balance is 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 a little a little uh, heavier on one side than it is on the other. But but how have you you know last couple months, last last two months, last six months, how have you been managing that? You know, how have you been balancing work and and non work? 
Yeah, it's been a challenge for sure. And I, I think there's a little bit of serendipity and luck that this is all happening during the pandemic. So I don't have FOMO of my friends playing ball or my family doing like barbecues, whatever. These days, my my weeks are very much wake up, start the day doing work. Um, and it really is a marathon. There aren't like pockets of downtime where I like chill out. The only times I watch TV these days are when Roham's getting interviewed, um, which is cool. And it's super surreal. And uh, I think there will come a time uh, in the not too distant future where, you know, I, I'll take a couple of days off. Um, but right now, like the community uh, is so passionate and there are a lot of kind of things we need to work on as a, a organization. And uh, I, I take it as a great privilege and opportunity to try to be a glue guy and, and bridge that gap as much as I can uh, between the, the community and the company and all that we're doing. And we work, we, we do a lot like, and Luke, you know this better than anyone. But a day in Top Shot is like, or a week in Top Shot, I should say, is like, it feels like a year goes by. And like that manifests itself in product tweaks and updates and uh, metrics to share with the community and all these different things. And, um, you know, I think I think back to, you know, a few months ago, I was like relentlessly following up with trading card collectors on YouTube to try to get a just a phone call, just to talk to them and see if they would give Top Shot a chance. And now it, it, I don't have we're, we're not marketing, right? Like we don't we just don't have that bandwidth to, to grow, nor nor are we in a position where, you know, certainly beyond organic traffic. And there's plenty of that still. And uh, today's announcements, we're recording this on Tuesday. March 30th. Today's announcements are certainly going to bring more people in. Maintaining that balance has been difficult. The adage goes, you find a job you love, you never have to work a day in your life. Well, I love my job and I definitely am still working every day of my life, but I, I feel very privileged to have this opportunity to, to work on something so cool. This is a really hard question, but who's your best friend at work? Mm, and you can't, you can't say hard. Rohem or Katie because that's just cheating. You know, you can't say, you can't say your bosses or anything like that. <laughs> I love my team. And, and when I say my team, I, I look at kind of a community team. And Usman has just been such a kind of champion of the community. And I have a ton of respect for the amount of effort and, and labor he puts into kind of making sure the, the community is taken care of and addressed. Uh, Candy, uh, who's been a mod since the Crypto Kitties days, has been an awesome addition to our team. Uh, Daniel, who goes by Kelikin in Discord, has been a fantastic addition. Mustafa, who we recently added to the team, has been a fantastic addition. And then Trevor, who, who does everything behind the scenes between Twitter and Instagram, has been a fantastic addition as well. So, um, and, and Trevor actually has been with Dapo Lab since before I joined. So he, he kind of helped uh, show me the ropes in my first few weeks. Um, and then, and then kind of stretching outside of the team, I'm just like in awe every day of a lot of people on the team. Certainly like our engineers are world class and they're doing really high level complex uh, solves for issues that don't have a kind of snap of your fingers fix. But I look at uh, what Alan does as far as doing like picking kind of addition sizes and tiers and understanding the economy of Top Shot better than literally anyone in the world. And I'm just kind of in awe of kind of how he keeps that all in his head. And then um, Arthur as well has been, uh, he, he is the head of our product. He's just been an unbelievable champion of kind of ruthless prioritization and making sure that the community's voice is heard internally. And, and he has five to 12 different kind of stakeholders on every single decision that's being made. And I, I just think that he does a tremendous job in really stressful times of keeping a level head and, and making uh, everyone both feel valued, but also making sure that their opinions are heard. It's a great way to answer the question is to go through the whole roster. <laughs> oh, we, I, I left off 90% of the team, which is unfair because yeah, I'm fair, thinking yeah. in my head actively, like there are so many more people that I want to give shout outs to. 
Um, it's all good. Yeah. I'll, I'll limit it to that just for I'm, out of respect to the question. So you can, they know they're loved. It's, the it's okay. Um, okay. I have one more question and then I, and then I do have a, a game um, digging deep into Jacob Eisenberg, Google search. There is a clip of an interview question asked to Kobe Bryant in a scrum and it's asked by you. Tell me about that. Yeah, that was really cool. Um, I think that was the year that he had just come back from, I want to say it was the kill, the Achilles injury. So. And he had only been playing for four or five games and Steve Blake was injured and Steve Nash was injured. And Kobe Bryant was the de facto point guard of the Lakers at that time. And it was really, you know, a super convenient timing that I got Kobe in a season he didn't play very many games. Um, I got to kind of be in the locker room and watch him play um, in like the four or five game stretch that he actually played that season. But the article I was writing at the time it was all around this same premise and similar to what we've been talking about here, Luke, how context switching and going from being the alpha dog on your team to being a role player is really tough for a lot of players. And Nick Young, I think, was a perfect example of someone that growing up was compared to Kobe Bryant, an electric scorer from Los Angeles. Um, and I always thought that Nick Young had the potential to be a, a, a star. But the thing that was missing was that kind of knowing when to anticipate the defense is going to be over aggressive and then skip passing to the corner slash and kick trying to find the teammate that's open because nick young had developed a reputation at that point as being kind of a ball hog and kobe of course had that reputation for years as well and kobe in those five games was concentrate making a concentrated effort to be primary offensive distributor so i thought it was a really interesting window of time to ask kobe about how much whether him or as a generic scorer how much of a concentrated effort do you have to put into being a passer on the floor and the quote was perfect it answered you know the question perfectly and i think like in that time kobe was being asked a lot of questions and I, i've watched that scrum over um, just because how surreal an opportunity to talk to one of the, the greatest players and a, a genuine icon. Um, and all of the other questions from that scrum, and maybe not all, but a lot of them were, what did you learn in this game back? Like, how are you feeling physically? And those are just like, he was getting that every interview he did, right? So I think he appreciated, not to give myself too much of a pat on the back, but I think he, he recognized that the question was not one that he was getting asked every day. Maybe you have a pretty thoughtful answer too. But yeah, I mean, I, I look back on those days, Luke, and it's kind of surreal. I got to cover the Rockets in James Harden's second game. Uh, he had just scored 40 plus with the Piston against the Pistons the night before. And Jeremy Lin was still the star of the Rockets at that time, right? So I got to, I had like five minutes one on one with James Harden. No competition in the locker room. That was a perk of being in Atlanta, um, but really, really cool. And, and yeah, I, I remember just crossing names off my bucket list of, okay, tonight I get to go to the Warriors game and talk to Steph and Draymond. Uh, yeah. So all that. Well, now, all now Jacob, stuff. now you get to stream with them when they open Top Shot Packs. <laughs> I'm still pinching myself. It's, <laughs> it, it's, it's unbelievable and it's super exciting. And um, how much these players have loved Top Shot has been just super reinforcing and rein, not reinvigorating because I've been invigorated, but uh, it makes me so excited about the future because there are so many different ways we could gamify player versus play. These guys are the most competitive players in the world, oh, yeah. right? Like we could, we could gamify the experience of player X and player Y going up against each other and competing in doing things. And I'm going to keep those details sort of vague. I'll let the community use their imagination, but I think, the possibilities are endless. I'm not playing the speculation game again, so not for a while. <laughs> so I'm not. I won't even say anything to that. Okay, we're we're, all, we're pretty much out of time, but I, I do have a game we have to play. If you listen to the podcast, you know that the game is typically called "Would You Rather." But today we have a special edi edition, and it's actually going to be a pop quiz about your favorite Nick Pablo Prigioni. Okay, I and I just are you going to ask? Well, hold on. Well, maybe not. Maybe some softball ones in here for you. Okay. 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 Easy one to start. How old was Pablo when he made his Knicks debut? 
believe he was 35. Correct. What is the name of the town he was born in? Oh, it's tough. Rosario? No, it's I don't know. Rio Tercero. Okay, okay. Maybe some easier ones coming up. During his play, playing career, he played with Basconia, where they won several titles in the 2000s. Three Spanish King Cups, 2004, 2006, 2009. Four Spanish Super Cups, 05, 06, 07, 08. And one Spanish League Championship. What year was that Spanish League Championship? Uh, I'm going to go 2008. Yes. I, I feel like I'm... Okay, yes. I, I got it. Wow. <laughs> you got it. Okay. That, okay. <laughs> That's awesome. Okay. I'll take it. In the two thousand speaking of that year, in the two thousand eight Summer Olympics, uh, they finished they finished third. They finished with the bronze with a win over Lithuania, eighty seven to seventy five. He led the team in assists. How many assists did he get in that game? In the in the bronze, uh, bronze medal, medal game. game. In the bronze medal game. Yeah. Uh, I'll say seven. Yes. Oh my god, you know that. <laughs> okay, last one. Last one. During those two thousand, I feel like I'm on slub dog, slub dog million. Yeah, it's pretty much what it feels like. There's like, a lived experience. Right? <laughs> okay, well, this, this is the last one. It's about those Olympics. During those two thousand eight Summer Olympics, Prigioni was yes. he was third in assists in average assists um, per game, four point six, which placed him ahead of Chris Paul, Manu Ginobili, and LeBron James. He also led the entire tournament in another category. Which one? Steals? Yes, with 2.6 per game. That's pesky Prish. Yeah. He steals inbounds and no one sees it coming. You, awesome. you nailed that. You The only one you got wrong is his hometown, which I wouldn't expect you to know. I'd expect you to know his, his playing stats, not his hometown. So that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I'll take it. Yeah, and if you ask me in the NBA question, like, I I know Prish really well, po- like, from debut with the Knicks to, you know, retiring. And now he's an assistant with the Timberwolves. But yeah, he had a nice little stint with the Rockets, which was exciting because it reaffirmed to me. I think Daryl Morey, I know he's been a guest on your show, is one of the the smartest basketball minds. And knowing that uh, Morey saw something in Priz was reaffirming to me that like, no, this guy is not just kind of a gimmick player. Like he's legitimate. Then he actually had a nice little cup of coffee with the Clippers uh, as Chris Paul's backup. He, he's been he's been uh, he's had kind of his run around the league and he was a head coach in Spain for a very short while and had a little controversy there. Came back was an assistant with Brooklyn and mm-hmm. is now an assistant with Minnesota. Mm-hmm. That's awesome. I love I, I honestly didn't really know much about him before I got to know you. And now now I feel so much closer to him as well as like that kind of like a underdog story joining the NBA so late. So. Well, Jacob, it's been great to have you, man. Uh, I, I think it's been an awesome convo and, and great to look into your basketball mind. Luke, thank you so much for having me. Definitely a departure from my typical interviews these days, which uh, certainly is welcome. So I appreciate uh, the research you've done. And uh, as I've said many times before, and will continue to say, the work that you and your team do at the First Mint is second to none. Uh, it's an awesome resource for our community, and it's been Really cool to see not only you develop your kind of voice as the authoritative host of the First Mint and the de facto voice for the Top Shot community, but it's also been really cool to see just how rabid your community at the First Mint has become, right? So uh, from the Twitter followers that speak for themselves, uh, uh, both as far as like the number of followers you have, which is really impressive, but also... Um, how how excited they are every time there's a, a morsel of rumor to, to jump on, <laughs> which yes. sometimes leads to headaches for us. But we, uh, we I know it's yeah. all in good spirit. We will be diligent with our with our, our our in differentiating between what is speculation and what is based in fact. <laughs> we will be uh, diligent uh, continuing from here. And that is going to do it for today. Everybody, have a great rest of your week. Make sure you find us on Twitter at The First Mint. Go visit the website. We're posting some awesome content there. TheFirstMint.com. TheFirstMint.com. My editor will kill me if I say it wrong. And of course, like I asked, please rate and subscribe the podcast. I very much appreciate it. Otherwise, we will see you next week on The First Mint.